Trying to turn off all cell phones, rager, blackberries, camera speakers, recording monitors, bureau phones, any other audio producing device, loud we know he's here, we know he does something.
afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, begin with a statement. Some time ago I said that after the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, fixing health care for our wounded at every stage of their recovery was my highest priority as Secretary of Defense. Last week the Department of Defense Mental Health Task Force issued its report on the state of mental health services within the department. I would like to thank the co-chairs, Vice Admiral Arthur and uh, Dr. McDermott, and all the participants for their time and service. The panel concluded that current mental health care efforts, however well-intentioned, and I quote, fall significantly short, unquote, of adequately serving service members and their families, a conclusion reinforced by recent press accounts. I again thank the media for their focus on the well-being of our men and women in uniform. The Defense Mental Health Task Force report outlines several areas where this department can, and I would say must, transform the way we meet the psychological needs of our servicemen and women. It called meeting these goals a, quote, achievable vision, unquote. I agree. This is something that we can, must, and will get fixed. Among other important goals, the task force report called on this department to build a culture of support for psychological health throughout the military by removing the stigma associated with seeking help. One change I support and will very aggressively pursue is removing the question about mental health treatment from the security clearance questionnaire, a government-wide form. Too many avoid seeking mental health help because of fear of losing their security clearance. I've also discussed the stigma issue with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and I am confident they will provide strong leadership in an effort to overcome this impediment to proper mental health care. Leaders at every level must follow suit. This department is required by law to provide Congress with a corrective action plan within six months. I have no intention of waiting that long. I have directed that the action plan for implementation of the 95 DOD task force recommendations be completed within 60 to 90 days. The scope of our effort is even broader than this suggests. Along with the results of other studies, the Department is now reviewing in detail some 331 recommendations. These recommendations deal with broad mental health issues including PTSD and TBI. Other studies are still in process, so the total number of recommendations we must address will probably not be available until October. In the meantime, the Department of Defense is partnered with the Department of Veterans Affairs to provide integrated solutions to all of the recommendations. This team is working full-time and reports weekly to an oversight group chaired by the deputies of both departments. Jointly, we have already begun implementation of corrective actions and will continue this process until a fully responsive and caring system is in place for our men and women. Fixing our mental health Mental, military mental health system will require changing not only what we do within the department but possibly legislative changes as well and I'm confident that Congress will continue to be a strong supporter in supporting our a strong partner in supporting our military just over a week ago I was in Germany and went to Landstuhl Army Hospital I visited the bedside of several soldiers fresh from Iraq who were recovering from their wounds I presented six Purple Hearts, including one to a soldier who was still unconscious and on a respirator. It was a starkly moving and emotionally powerful reminder of the sacrifices these young men and women are making on our behalf. It is our moral obligation and duty to ensure that they are properly cared for in mind, body, and spirit when they return from the battlefield to the homeland that they have pledged to defend. They have done their duty we must do ours. General? I would add that uh, the chiefs are energized on this issue and they are intent, we are intent on uh, making sure that we provide the proper leadership to ensure that everybody who needs any kind of uh, assistance with mental health uh, gets it. Not only for those who have already served honorably and well, uh, but also those who are currently in combat. As you know, the surge force now is, is in place 
Uh, we've got folks in 115 degree weather working extremely hard uh, to do this nation's business, and they deserve to know uh, that we're going to provide for them in every way we can when they come back out of battle. Leader? Mr. Secretary, and, and also for you, General Pace, um, we've seen uh, a spike in violence over the last couple of days as this new operation has begun. And I'm wondering if you can address whether or not um, this suggests to you that commanders in Iraq may be correct in their arguments that they may need to sustain this level of troops for a longer period of time. And also, um, does it put more pressure, do you think, on the military to show some improvement and some progress by September? I'll answer first and then invite General Pace. Uh, it seems to me that there's a, uh, that the reason for the spike in violence is that, uh, as General Petraeus uh, has indicated, uh, our troops and the Iraqi troops are going into areas where they haven't been for some time, uh, and they anticipated that there would be uh, a high level of combat uh, as they did that. Uh, I think that we'll just have to wait and see uh, the progress of these um, um, offensives and uh, in terms of the recommendations that are made in early September in terms of answering your other questions. But, General, you want to? Well, I think certainly from the standpoint of the commanders on the ground, uh, this is exactly what needs to be done to assist in providing a level of security that buys the time for the Iraqi government to uh, provide the uh, governance and provide the economic opportunities for their citizens. So this is the right thing to do. And as the Secretary said, uh, later on uh, this summer we'll get some uh, input, uh, some feedback from both uh, General Petraeus and uh, Ambassador Crocker and be able to make recommendations to the President. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, you just talked about mental health and so forth. I'm wondering if you could comment the Pentagon's mental health survey released last month talked to, recommended 30 days off in theater for every soldier and Marine that experienced 90 days of heavy combat. The report also said that one-third of those on multiple deployments who experience heavy combat experience mental health problems. Can they get that amount of time off, and should they? Well, we're just examining these recommendations uh, at the current time. Uh, I think, to be honest, uh, it would be a challenge to manage that uh, at current force levels. Uh, but we will examine that recommendation along with all the others. But if you don't manage that, if they don't get the time off, aren't there more people going to be coming home with mental health problems? Well, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, you know, they, it's a good report. Uh, I have no reason to question the report. Uh, we are just going to have to ensure that if we do have more troops coming back with, uh, with problems, uh, that we have the resources in place and the procedures to make sure that they're properly treated. You know, there's another part of that as well, and, uh, and the, the uh, medical data is, is very important and needs to be taken into consideration. Not uh, quite as scientific, but also I think a fact to be considered is the fact that normally our highest casualties in a unit are in the first period of a deployment and in the last period of a deployment. And a lot of it has to do with mindset and, and having, having total focus. And the numbers of times that you put yourself into and out of uh, combat situation changes how you're thinking, what you're mentally prepared to do. We, just need, we need to take a look at the entire spectrum of impacts, not only the very important factor of mental stress, but also the factor of ensuring that we've got folks mentally focused so they do come home uh, in, in the best possible condition, both physically and mentally. Can you shed some light on the silent <coughs> penetration that occurred yesterday that prompted the Pentagon to take down part of its email system affecting up to 1,500 workers? And also, was your email affected by this uh, hack, sir? Well, to answer the second question first, I don't do email. <laughs> I'm a very low-tech person. Uh, uh, the reality is that uh, the, uh, the Defense Department is constantly under attack. Um, elements of the OSD unclassified uh, email system uh, were taken offline uh, yesterday afternoon uh, uh, due to a detected penetration. Um, a variety of precautionary measures are being taken. Uh, we expect the system to be online again very soon. Uh, we obviously have redundant systems in place and there's no anticipated uh, adverse impact on ongoing operations. There will be some administrative disruptions and personal inconveniences. Um, it will come as no surprise that we aggressively monitor uh, intrusions 
and have appropriate procedures to address events of this kind. But as I say, um, we get perhaps hundreds of, of attacks a day. Just one follow-up. If you get hundreds of attacks a day, what was yes, unique about this attack that prompted the takedown of a, a limited part of the network? Well, I don't know the answer to that, and uh, and they're still investigating it, so I'm, I don't know the answer to your specific question. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in his uh, confirmation hearing earlier this week, Acting Army Secretary Guerin said, uh, uh, if the surge continues beyond its anticipated length, that it may be necessary to extend deployments for U.S. troops there in Iraq. Uh, they're already on 15-month deployments in Iraq. Is, is that physically possible or even politically possible to extend those troops in Iraq beyond that 15-month period? Well, I think, I think that's a worst-case scenario, and, and I don't anticipate uh, having to move to that. Our policy is uh, 15 months. Uh, we did we extended beyond 12 months reluctantly and only to ensure that every soldier and marine got at least or every soldier got at least a year at home. Uh, it is my hope uh, that uh, we can at some point move back to 12 months deployed, 12 months at home, and then to our eventual goal, which is 12 months deployed and two years at home. Uh, but as I say, I think beyond 15 uh, months is a worst-case scenario, and, and we're focused on the 15-month and then and rolling that back as soon as we can. Yeah. Sir, there was a, a building struck in Diala province that was the headquarters <coughs> for the 1920 brigades, which is a group that had switched sides and started working with U.S. troops against al-Qaeda lately. Four people were killed in that attack. It was a U.S. bomb that struck the building. Isn't it risky to have that kind of a mistake in a in a place like Diana where you're relying on groups like the 1920 Brigades and these shakes, tribal shakes, who are switching sides and helping with um, U.S. forces as they go in and try and route out, route out Al Qaeda? Can you comment on that incident? This is the first I've heard of it, so I I think I don't know whether you can. I've not not heard of that particular incident, but certainly uh, n no force in the world uh, takes more precautions and is more precise in the application of combat power uh, than the United States is. And it is unfortunate uh, when either the intelligence uh, that we are acting on or in the, in the delivery of the weapons uh, that, we, that we strike uh, a target. One thing that's also true, though, is any time that we have those kinds of mistakes, we investigate it, we find out what happened, we take the corrective actions either in the systems or against the individuals involved, depending upon what, what the incident was. So, uh, do those kinds of things happen in, in combat? Yes, they do. Uh, but unlike our enemy, who takes great pride in uh, uh, putting women and children in harm's way, uh, we take great pride in our precision and in our follow-up when something does go wrong. John? Yeah, um, Secretary and, and uh, General Pace, th th it's been a pretty bad couple of days in terms of losses, American losses in Iraq. I think it's 12 in the last two days uh, killed. Is this uh, something we're going to expect and should be bracing for in, in the coming weeks and months as we have the, the, the tempo of operations increases and you have the surge forces on the ground? And if I can also just picking up on the question about the 1920s Brigade, do, do, do you have some concern or do you have some pause about working and joining forces with groups that so recently had been uh, aiming some of their firepower or affiliated with those that have been aiming their firepower at American forces? Remind me again what were your first question was. about the, the 12 deaths over the last two oh. days. Um, the offensives have, this, the, this new offensive has been underway just a few days. Uh, I think that General Petraeus, um, he certainly indicated to me when I was there last week that he expected it would be very tough fighting, at least initially, uh, when they moved into these uh, areas uh, uh, for the first time. Um, we certainly hope and pray that that level of uh, casualties will not be sustained, that will not continue, but uh, they are in the middle of a battle, and, and uh, uh, we just, we just uh, will have to deal with that. With respect to the second part of your question, um, you know, part of, part of trying to um, bring some measure of, of uh, peace to Iraq is going to be persuading people who have been fighting to stop fighting and become a part of a political process. 
And so it seems to me that uh, in, in a number of different sectors, um, the embassy and our forces are going to be talking to people who not long ago may well have been shooting at us. And I, I think I have to defer uh, to the judgment of those on the ground. And after all, we also are working with the Iraqi government in all of this in terms of making uh, the decision uh, of deciding uh, whether to work with these people and whether to arm them. After all, it's a strategy that has worked uh, extraordinarily well in Al Ambar province. Uh, and uh, in terms of working with uh, the local tribes and so on. And so I think this is trying to get more of the people who have been shooting to stop shooting and work with us, I think, is, is, is really the pathway forward in terms of accomplishing our objective and, and getting them to work with the Iraqi government. So, uh, but in terms of the specific decisions, I, I'm not going to try and second guess General Petraeus or, or the ambassador. Uh, General, you want to add anything on either part of that? All I would add to that is that uh, in addition to Al Anbar, you also have about 130 sheikhs in the Tikrit area who have banded together to fight against al-Qaeda. So is there risk involved with arming groups with whom you've been fighting before? Yes, but I think the greater risk is in not uh, seizing the opportunities as they come available. And as individuals and groups uh, determine that they are willing to uh, team with the Iraqi central government and that they no, no longer want uh, to be cowered by the uh, al-Qaeda, for example, that we should seize those opportunities and work with them and uh, try to get the Iraqi family uh, to pull together. Yeah. Well, can I just follow up on that for either one of you gentlemen, just sort of to be clear. <coughs> what, is, what, is, what is the ground rule here about arming elements in Iraq that may have, as you said, shot at us just a short time ago? Is the U.S. government arming elements in Iraq that may that engaged in combat against U.S. forces. And my question for General Pace goes more to the issue of the direct threat right now for U.S. troops. What can you tell us about the pace of attacks against U.S. troops, the type of attacks you're seeing, the larger IEDs? What is it that is causing this spike in U.S. casualties? But both questions, please. Uh, let, me, let me start with the second uh, question first, if I could. Um, I asked the question, you know, we've got, we got all kinds of data available to us. I, I asked the question uh, just the other day, Take a, tell me about the, the numbers of incidents per day. What is it now compared to what it was back in January, for example? And it was, it was interesting that based on the number of U.S. brigades operating on the battlefield, the number of contacts with the enemy has remained relatively constant, of, of a low of about five contacts with the enemy per, per day, per brigade, up to a high of about seven contacts with the enemy per day, per U.S. brigade of about 3,500 folks. So when you add the additional five brigades, the number of incidents have gone up, but the number of contacts per brigade has been relatively stable in that five to seven range. That's a data point. Uh, clearly, uh, the kinds of IEDs that uh, uh, happened yesterday where we lost five uh, soldiers in one attack and four in another. Uh, those are the kinds of attacks that our enemy uh, would like to in impose on us. Uh, when you look at the uh, trend of um, June compared to May, it's not as high in June as it was in May. However, every death is uh, um, significant to us, and our enemy knows that it's significant to us. But as we do these sweeps in areas that uh, we've been through before, but now we're going to go in and, and hold, as we're taking uh, the fight uh, to the enemy with the additional troops, uh, we can expect that there's going to be tough. There's going to be tough fighting ahead, and we're going to expect that our enemy is going to want to impact uh, the psyche here in the United States with regard to the number of uh, significant incidents that, that they're able to pull off and the total numbers of, uh, of casualties that they're able to produce. So it is an ex expectation that this surge is going to result in more contact and, and therefore uh, more casualties. And Mr. Secretary, is the United States arming elements in Iraq that have engaged in combat or may have against the U.S. or may have killed U.S. troops? 
and how can you assure people that you may have vetted that situation? Well, as I say, I, I defer those decisions to the commanders on the ground and, and the embassy and the Iraqi government. Um, but, sir, Prime Minister Maliki raised this with me, and, and clearly they're concerned, and he's appointed a, a uh, committee uh, to uh, work this issue and, and be a part of the vetting process. Um, but as I say, you know, I, I, we've, got a, we've got a lot of conflict going on uh, in Iraq. I've talked to this uh, to you all before about the number of different conflicts that are going on, the, the five or six different conflicts. And, and if we refuse to uh, work with or uh, ally with uh, everybody who's been on the other side of the fence, uh, then the prospects for making any progress in Iraq are pretty slim. And um, General Pace, a question for you. It's your first time in the briefing room since the Secretary announced that you would not be renominated. Um, and he indicated the main reason for that is he felt senators would focus very much on Iraq. Um, how fair do you feel that decision is, and how personally responsible do you feel for the fact that the war in Iraq has not gone as well as had been hoped? Well, look, I, I have had the great honor and privilege of serving first four years as vice chairman, now two years as chairman. In every recommendation that I have made and all the military advice that I have given, I have had the benefit of uh, a team of folks around me who have uh, uh, made it possible for me to understand as much of the situation as I could to give my best uh, military advice. Uh, I understand the Constitution of the United States which calls for the President to propose and the Senate to dispose. Uh, neither of those two things is going to happen. But I am uh, chairman, and I'm going to be chairman until midnight on 30 September. And through midnight on 30 September, I'm going to do all that I can to stay focused on providing support to the troops who are in combat and come 0001 on 1 October, if he's confirmed, Admiral uh, Mike Mullen will, will, will pick up that responsibility and I'm sure he'll be as honored to serve as I have been. Yeah. Sir, can I get back to General Petraeus' September uh, report that we're expecting? This is the very early weeks of your tenure. You focused on this issue of wanting a report, I think originally mid-summer, but now, now late summer, early fall, a, a report card on how it's progressing so you can make a judgment on whether to continue. We've heard from the White House in the last week or two that they, they're stepping back a bit, it seems, at least rhetorically. The press is paying, paying too much attention to the September report. You guys are making it too big a deal. I mean, from a press point of view, the reason we were making a big deal is because we thought you were making a big deal about this. C can you talk a bit about whether there's a disconnect between you and the White House over the importance of this Petraeus report in September? Um, no, I don't think there's a disconnect. The um what I actually started saying and testifying in uh, January and February was that I thought that we would be able to determine fairly early on from the military side, uh, the security side, whether or not the Iraqis were keeping the commitments that they had made to us as part of the Baghdad security plan. And I said I thought we would be able to uh, make that evaluation reasonably quickly by uh, early summer by May, June. And I think we have been able to make that determination. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think that uh, we've been satisfied that the Iraqis have, uh, have in fact met the commitments that, that, uh, that they made in that particular arena. What I did say, though, also was that in terms of the other aspects of the, uh, the strategy, in terms of political reconciliation and legislation and the economic development side, uh, that it would take longer. I think that, uh, that part of the reason that, uh, that September has taken on the, uh, or it has, is in, in no small part uh, the result of the debate in Congress uh, over the past several months and, and the debate between the President uh, the conflict between the President and the Congress in terms of benchmarks and when the reporting would happen and so on. So there will be a report under the legislation, there will be a report to the, con to the Congress on July 15th, and I think it's actually in the legislation that there will be a report in mid-September. So, so September is now inscribed in legislation, so it's not just sort of some 
uh, ar arbitrary date uh, picked out there. It's something to which uh, everybody is going to have to respond. And, and I think you'd be naive in the extreme not to believe uh, that the Congress is going to be very focused uh, on, on that report and on the decisions that the President makes uh, as a result of that report. Sir, back to your decision, just wrote to uh, your recommendation to the President, your decision essentially not to renominate General Pace as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. That's being portrayed by some people as a sign of weakness on your part, uh, that you are, uh, the accusation is that you're kowtowing to Congress, essentially ceding to Senator Carl Levin <coughs> Uh, the, you know, the decision of who gets to be your and the President's senior military advisor. What's your response to that, that you were too quick to cave on this? If, as you said in your statement, you actually did intend to, to renominate uh, General I, Pace originally. I would recommend that people go back and read the statement that I originally gave here when I made that decision, when I was very explicit that it was in my consultations with both Democrats and Republicans that I had drawn that conclusion and uh, discussed it with the President. Um, I received the same kind of concerns from Republicans that I did from Senator Levin and from others on the Democratic side. So uh, I think to, uh, uh, to paint this in the terms that you described uh, simply is not consistent with the facts. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The number of people who have who have studied your tenure since you took office have come to the conclusion that as the debate over Iraq goes forward within the administration, you will try to push that debate in the direction of a lower U.S. military profile and less involvement in combat in Iraq. Are they reading you right? Well, I spent several decades as a Kremlinologist, and sometimes I got it right and sometimes I didn't. I'll leave it at that. What about these? <laughs> they got it right or got it wrong? They'll find out. Uh, Mr. Secretary, also for uh, General Pace, I'm wondering if you can talk about what the commander's expectations are for this uh, offensive, what the effect will be. Do they expect uh, that this will uh, significantly reduce the violence to the uh, before September? Do they expect to break Al Qaeda? Or are their expectations much more modest than that? I think, first of all, if you try to define this in terms of level of violence, you've really put yourself on the wrong metric. It isn't about X number today, Y number tomorrow, because the enemy gets a chance to vote in that. And uh, he will take a look at what you're, what you're measuring and try to defeat that measurement, so to speak. What we're trying to do is to get for the Iraqi government enough space inside of which that they can do the good governance uh, that they promised that they will do with regard to um, the laws that they're going to pass and the economics. The metric really should be for uh, Iraqi citizens. Do they feel better about their lives today than they did yesterday? And do they think they're going to feel better about their lives tomorrow than they do today? If they do and if they see that their country is moving forward, without regard to the specific instances of violence, if they feel better about where they are and where they're going, then the security environment is providing what it should be providing, which is a level of security inside of which their governments can function. If you had zero violence and people were not feeling good about their future, where are you? So it's not about levels of violence. It's about progress being made in fact in, in the minds of the Iraqi people so that they have, so they have confidence in their government in, in the way forward. I'd like to go back to um, the question that uh, Jamie McIntyre asked because I think there's something else I need to remind you all of from my uh, original statement with respect to the chairman. As I said at the time, that was a recommendation to the president that I made with great regret and that he accepted with reluctance. Uh, it had been my hope uh, that I would have the opportunity to continue to serve with General Pace through the end of the administration. But at the end of the day, based on the consultations with both Democrats and Republicans, it seemed to me that 
uh, confirmation hearing was going to be focused on the past and essentially uh, reopen all of the issues of the past six years in a way that was not constructive for the country uh, or for our men and women in uniform or, in my opinion, uh, for General Pace himself. Uh, so uh, I admire Mike Mullen and I look forward to working with him very much. He's a person of uh, extraordinary capability and face confirmed. Uh, I think he'll be a good chairman, a great chairman. Um, but he knows uh, uh, the circumstances as well as I do, uh, and and it's it's frankly just a, a recognition of reality and also my belief uh, that at this point it is important uh, for us all to look to the future uh, and not to the past. Thank you very much. Back on the level of violence. <laughs> 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 okay, level of violence. Oh, the, the, last, the last hard data we have on the levels of violence comes from the report to Congress, and that was current through May 15th, and that said the overall level of violence was essentially unchanged. Actually, if you looked at the chart, it was up a little bit since before the uh, surge started. So bring us up to date from May 15th to today on what has happened to the, the levels of violence now that we have all five brigades there. Um, total numbers up a little bit, but as I mentioned uh, before, uh, total, total events per brigade in the field ab about, about the same. Uh, and again, um, from, my, from my point of view, uh, although that's an, an interesting uh, statistic, it is not the driving statistic. If what we focus on, if what we uh, American people focus on, and if what we uh, military commanders um, project is based on the levels of violence, then all our, all our enemy has to do is put together more bombs and have more incidents. That's not the measure. You make it sound like you can do that at will, though, any time he wants to well, increase the, the, the level of violence. The, en the, enemy's a think the enemy's a thinking enemy, and he has uh, soldiers at his disposal, and they can decide uh, to surge or not surge like we can sur surge or not surge. So it's not about the levels of violence. It's about what I mentioned, which is the belief of the Iraqi people in their government and in their situation today versus yesterday and what they believe tomorrow will be. So is it up a little bit? Uh, yes, it is up a little bit. It's lower than it was, but it's up a little bit compared to last month, and, and that'll change over time as operations begin and stop and people regroup. But and it's the wrong metric to chase. And, you know, just another one of the metrics that is up and down is the number of sectarian murders. Those were up, those were way down. Uh, for the first three months. Uh, they were up some in May. Uh, as I recall, General Petraeus told me last uh, week when I was there that they're down um, fairly considerably again. So, you know, we're going to have to wait and see. Like, like General Petraeus points out, that 5th Brigade only started its operations last week. And, and I would just make one other statement. This joint security station that I visited in Baghdad last week the, the brigade commander there told me that he had covered the entire area uh, relating to that joint security station with one brigade until the surge. He now has three, and he says it makes a big difference in terms of the overall security. Hey, General, Thank I'm you. Sure, General, I'm not Thank sure you. if you answered uh, the question about personal responsibility for the situation. 